Welcome to Wild Connection, the podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Jennifer Vertolin. I'm a scientist and author that studies animal behavior. I'm passionate about animals and exploring the complexity of their lives, their intelligence, relationships, families, social connections, and emotions. I also love helping people reconnect with nature to live better lives. This podcast is about you, other animals, and how we're all connected in this wild and crazy thing called life. Welcome back to another episode of Wild Connection. So it's been another year of the Congress of Parties, otherwise known as COP. It finished on December 15th. And after 28 of these, we are remarkably worse off every year. This year, it was held in an oil-rich, oil-focused country that initially committed to not reducing their extraction and reliance on fossil fuels. At least someone committed to something we can count on. With 85,000 people in attendance, there's not much good news to report. Here's a brief recap as we enjoy this warmer than usual winter in the United States during the hottest year on record. There was no commitment to phase out the use of coal, oil, and gas, but there were some countries that signed on to reduce their use and reinvest in renewable energy. Some notable exceptions were China, India, and Russia. Despite agreement by many, despite agreement by many and commitments to cooling and reducing methane, once again, there was no adoption of the implementation strategies outlined in what was supposed to be the final word on this, the Paris Agreement. What this means is climate instability will increase, food insecurity will increase, water shortages will increase, coastal areas will continue to disappear and intense periodic weather events will become more common and unpredictable at the same time. That's what this week's episode is all about. Now, before we get started, a reminder that you can find the show notes on my website at jenniferverdelin.com or on the podcast website, Wild Connection, the podcast hosted by Podbean. And if you haven't done so already, sign up for my newsletter and follow the show. We have loads of cool guests coming up, and I don't want you to miss a single episode. In this episode, I have a not-so-ordinary conversation about climate with writer David Gessner, and we invite you to think about how to talk through what climate change really means from a new point of view, one that connects us instead of divides us. We talk about his book, A Traveler's Guide to the End of the World, Tales of Fire, Wind, and Water. David is also a professor, former Ultimate Frisbee player extraordinaire, and launched a journal called Ecotone that was recently awarded the Firecracker Prize. All right, let's get to it. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Wild Connection, the podcast. I'm excited to have author former Ultimate Frisbee champion, David Gessner, uh, on the show to talk about a lot of things, including his book, A Traveler's Guide to the End of the World, Tales of Fire, Wind, and Water. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Jennifer. Happy to be here. Uh, You know, we've been uh, trying to make sure we connect to do this interview for a little while, and I was really... uh, intrigued and alarmed and uh, inspired by your book. But before we get into the details of the book, I always like to have listeners get to know my guests a little bit and find out how you came to be where you are and do what you do. So would you be willing to share a little bit about your background and how you ended up where you are? Yeah. Um, well, there's an august tradition of nature writing, obviously, but there's also a tradition of some of us who hate being called nature writers. And I, in fact, my third book was called Sick of Nature. Um, I've come to believe since that every book should be called Sick of the Last Book, because you've spent, you know, I just spent three years on climate, and everybody keeps asking me on these, is there hope? What should the policy be? 
And I'm like, it's not about hope. It's not about policy. But then now that I'm turning to the next book, I do find myself craving slightly more hopeful subject than what the world will be like in 2063. Um, But anyway, so I started as a writer in a way that I would tell my students they never should start as a writer, which I came to it in theory when I was in college. I wanted to be the greatest writer of all time, you know, by far. And I had read my Hemingway and my Thomas Wolfe and all my other, you know, white male delusional uh, books. And I got out of school and I said, now I'm going to write my book. But I'd never done what students now do, which is take their workshops and put in their apprenticeship. And it was really kind of a clunky transition for me. I worked as a framing carpenter for a while and as a later as a bookstore clerk and worked in a homeless shelter. But I really just tried to write this thing. And as I, I joke, and it's a little bit of a joke, that my characters were stilted and they quoted Thoreau to each other. And, you know, it was just this kind of um, bad writing, which you have to do to get to good writing, right? So I wrote a novel, sent it out to the biggest places, not knowing that, you know, I should be sending it to an agent. Wrote another one, um, got rejections all the way, got one line from a, an editor at a big place, which was, you are a writer of considerable talent. And I clung to that for dear life, that that sentence, because I hadn't really shown my work to anybody, including my girlfriend of seven years during my 20s. Um, so it was a slow start. Actually, I lost a friend this year, Mark Spitzer, who's a great writer, who has a book called Monster Fishing. And he was this kind of wacky nouveau beat who just sent stuff out wildly and was brave. And he kind of became my inspiration in my 30s to start sending my work out. So that's kind of like where I got, I started as a novelist, uh, which really paid off in my nonfiction in terms of dialogue and scenes and that sort of thing. But I kind of broke open after uh, I had testicular cancer when I was 30 in Worcester, Massachusetts, where my girlfriend was going to med school. And at some point I wrote in my journal, I don't know what's worse, Worcester or cancer. I mean, I, I hated being back in my hometown. But during that year, magically almost, I got rejected by almost all the writing schools I applied to, but got into Boulder, Colorado. So I was kind of airlifted from uh, Worcester to Boulder and really began to thrive in Boulder and came back from from cancer. So I turned around in Boulder and wrote a book about my dad's death. He he died pretty young and and my love of Cape Cod. And that was the beginning of this weird pattern of writing about places when I wasn't there. Because then I moved back with my wife, to who I just married, to Cape Cod, and wrote a book about loving Boulder. Um, so unlike the Wendell Berries of the world and maybe the Thoreaus of the world, I kind of defined myself from the beginning as a polygamous of place rather than the metaphor of marrying place. And this continued with my third book, which was called Return of the Osprey. It was about Osprey is coming back to Cape Cod after DDT and me coming back there after cancer. And it ended in a kind of Wendell Berry-esque note, which was, I will stay forever, you know, on Cape Cod or something, which is exactly how I got my job where I am now in Wilmington, North Carolina, because a, a professor read it and invited me to apply. And at the time, my wife was pregnant, and suddenly the idea of having a real job and health insurance were important. So 20 years ago, about, my daughter's 20. We moved down to Wilmington and uh, an unlikely place for me to be, you know, uh, a lover of the West and a lover of Cape Cod. But I've kind of made it work in terms of, I mean, the good fortune of being a professor is I have all summer to roam the West and get back to the Cape. And so part of my definition of a writer, uh, which continues in this climate book, is kind of uh, being in uncertainty and being in movement rather than being settled in in one place, which is the predominant metaphor of of this sort of writing. So, and that's kind of what I I think of myself as is, um, you know, this, no no ground is solid ground. And I think that is true of a lot of us right now, the people where I live on the hurricane coast and the people out west with the fires and and drought. Um, so, So it's kind of come around where moving here 
which wasn't what I thought I would do, has been a good thing for me in my writing. There's a lot to unpack in and everything that you said. One of the things that occurred to me when you were speaking about your early days as a, a novelist was that you said your characters were stilted and they quoted Thoreau to each other, which implies that you always felt a special relationship with the natural world. If it was even infusing your your fictional writing, where do you where did that come from for you? I'm um, just I think, you know, there's a there's a uh, it came from two places, books and nature. And I think that we underrate sometimes how much reading kind of reinfuses that original kind of primal animal delight in the natural world. Um, I had that. I was in, I played a lot of sports when I was young. Um, I was lucky enough to go to high school in Western Mass, which I still think is a remarkably beautiful place and, and privileged enough to spend most of my summers on Cape Cod. And I really felt pleasure in the, in the, in what Henry Beston, the Cape writer calls the elemental life in wind, water, fire. And, and so at, when I graduated, I moved down to Cape Cod, um, uh, to our family house that was never winterized and winterized it and saw the bird migrations coming through and just started to kind of like wanted to infuse my, I mean, I'm joking about the writing being stilted. It was, it wasn't great, but it wasn't bad either. Um, but it always had a lot of the natural world in it. Um, and I also, and this is not incidental and it's going to sound like a joke, but it, it really isn't. I also happened to do mushrooms quite a bit that year. <laughs> and the first publishable, non-stilted uh, sentences I, I published were actually during a kind of a, a trip um, that was, and and the per guy I was living with, a friend, during the same trip, he decided his career path, which was to go to Hollywood and write screenplays and and um and produce, and I wrote my first writable line. So. All that to say, and I hope my daughter isn't listening, it's not just goofy partying, you know, if, if done in the right spirit that can come from something like that, you know, sure. just get, get below the surface of everyday life to something more animal, which is always, you know, whether it's through that or through many other things and it, being in the natural world has been an important part of my, my writing and my life. Well, and I think that one of the things that, comes out to me about the previous books uh, to A Traveler's Guide to the End of the World is that many of them were were written about places and a sense of place that you experience. And I've always thought that we're disconnected from that feeling of sense of belonging to a place where we feel infused and connected to it through the natural world, through that experience. And that we're suffering in some way mentally, uh, but also it's one of the reasons why perhaps we're failing in our motivation or our commitment to doing something about what is happening. And this timing for us to be talking about this, it's, it's almost, it's sad because right now parts of the world are on fire. Uh, mm -hmm. the temperatures are exceeding, I think it was a hundred and like 17 or in, in Greece and in parts of the Mediterranean animals yeah. are, are dying because they can't cool off. There's been some jokes and memes about something called splooting where all it really means is that animals are laying flat with their legs and arms out, trying to cool their bodies by increasing the mm -hmm. surface area and they're failing. Um, and, and people are dying and floods are happening on one end. Drought is happening on another fires, yeah. you know, hurricanes. And, and again, you talk about this in the book, you know, that this sort of emphasis on the gloom and doom is really not helpful either. And so, I'm curious because this book is packed with so much for people to connect with, which is real people whose real mm -hmm. lives have been impacted with climate change and also infused with this inspired backdrop of how you connect to a place. You know, what motivated you to write 
a book that includes, you know, the end of the world <laughs> in the title. Right. Well, you know, I'd written an earlier book called My Green Manifesto, which was about paddling down the Charles River with a guy named Dan Driscoll. And it emphasized what I called limited nature or limited environmentalism, where Dan had focused in on this one small part of the world, very urban, you know, huge city, but a river coming in. And he Trojan horsed in native plantings. He was a city worker in a, a, by putting in bike paths. So that was like a limited victory, but paddling down there, it felt it felt wild to a certain extent, you know, even though we were going into Boston. And Dan said to me, you know, we're all hypocrites. We all fly or drive, um, but we need more hypocrites who fight. Um, too often, hypocrisy makes us feel like, well, I can't do anything anyway. But so it was kind of a messy, limited environmentalism. And one thing I said in that book is I'm never going to write a book it says called the end of or the doom of, or even though I greatly admire the end of nature by Bill McKibben. Um, but I did write it, and there's a little bit of a wink in the title because the book was kind of forced on me. It was actually two summers ago. I was on book tour for my last book, and before that, and everywhere I went, I mean, I started at home where my daughter. High school years had been Hurricane Florence, freshman year, fall, a good term in spring, Hurricane Dorian the next fall. And, and during these, her high school became a shelter and we evacuated. And then COVID you know, comes in. So here we're in a really fragile place. We're right on the, in the hurricane bullseye. But where I traveled in the summer in the West, I went out to do the book tour. I went to visit with, uh, Ken Slight, who's uh, the, the inspiration for the seldom seen Smith character in the Monkey Ranch Gang by Edward Abbey. And Ken had just experienced a fire that destroyed his Quonset hut, where he had all his notes and papers. And I came into town and the fire people were meeting and saying, well, the soil looks good. You should be OK. So the next night we had a birthday party for his wife. We hear a rumbling and a flash flood is carrying whole trees and boulders down the, you know, the middle of his property. So it was just this thing where everywhere I went, I was running. And that was a summer, just like New York is experiencing this summer. This is a summer of clouds of smoke everywhere in, in Boulder and in the West where I was. So I went out to see where the fire had come from, where the clouds had come from. And I went back to Paradise, which, of course, had gone through its horrendous fire a couple of years before and now had a new fire, Dixie. So I was like, this is not something off in the future. This is happening now. And for those of us who are aware of it, you know, who live in these places, it's very much obvious, whatever your politics are, that it's happening now. So I do think there's a certain advantage, just like with Hurricane Sandy hitting New York, with the clouds of smoke hitting New York. Because what I would argue, I, I, I'm a hopeful person, basically, but I, I'm anti-hope in a way in this book, just because I don't want to muddy the discussion and I don't want to have bullet points at the end and have it be policy. But what I would argue that I'm trying to do is create awareness. And that that's the step that when the majority of people is still missing. Not, you know, not anything but just like it's starting to permeate our consciousness, which I think it is, because it so much is because all the things you described have been happening. But I don't, you know, as a writer and as not a not a just journalist, no offense to journalists. I'm trying to present it in a way that's complicated and subtle and just raise awareness. Cause you know, you 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 know the statistics about, you know, basically nobody talks about it with their family and friends and 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 the percentage that think it's the most highest priority issue is like three percent or something. So it's like, you know, we got it, and I think it's happening. And I didn't run into a lot of climate deniers, that's for sure. We're kind of pushing the conversation to where we're aware of just what we're dealing with. And, and when you list those things, yeah, it's, it's here, it's now, it's a crisis, and we're not facing it. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because I was reading an article, I can't remember where, where a woman was quoted in Phoenix saying, how, how much hotter can it get? How, why is it so hot? And, and I, two things occurred to me. 
<laughs> one is it reminded me of like sort of chicken little, right? A lot of us have been like, Hey, the sky is falling. Listen, the sky is falling. The sky is going to fall. The right. sky is going to fall. And now people are like, why is the sky falling? Right. And you know, nature has laws and we have broken them. And we can't escape them just because we are the only species that has managed to systematically and thoroughly develop ways to modify the environment much greater than, say, an ant or a termite. Do maybe you, maybe beavers are competitive, but. Yeah, beavers are, and and of course now we're reintroducing beavers because we're like, wait, beavers are really good for flood control and managing water flow. We should put them back and we can't quite figure out how they did it. You know, do you think people genuinely connect with the idea that the things happening now are the consequence of our own actions? Well, I sure hope so. I mean, it just seems like uh, I mean, I guess we're, uh, you know, kind of prejudiced in that way in terms of uh, being inclined. I mean, I, I do think that, you know, I mentioned earlier, rebelling against the nature writer genre, and writing a book called Sick of Nature. I'm also starting to rethink that because I'm thinking, hey, maybe we've been on to something the whole time. <laughs> you know, I, I wrote somewhere, I don't think it made it into the book, but I said in an article for Orion magazine, I said, saying that nature writers are going to save the world is like a little like saying hobbits are going to save Middle Earth. And then it was like, but wait, they did. <laughs> you know? And so I think the genre, this is not exactly the, answering your question. I think the genre is well suited to bringing people along. I and mean, I think the first thing I say in the book is, come on a trip with me. You know, I think it, since it's an individual exploring places, observing the natural world, but also the people in it, I think it can be an effective means of of bringing people along. Because I do think that repression, I don't think it's just ignorance we're fighting against. I think it's repression. I think it's natural. You know, we don't sit around all day thinking about our own death. You know, it's just, you know, we have to put on blinders to some extent. But I think the decision to do that with this, which is natural, and you know, human beings do not do a very good job of thinking about the future, the, um, is is part of the problem. You know, I have that chapter called "Beneath the Ice," and I really do feel like you know, beneath our ice in our subconscious, we're aware of what's going on, and that um, how do we how do we break it through where it becomes. Um, more part of our conscious life awareness again, I guess. I would say. Sure. And we're not alone in that in terms of other species also don't sit around contemplating every day, their death or what's happening next year. They're responding to cues in their environment that help them make decisions to live another day and hopefully another year. <laughs> um, yeah. Right. And, and so some animals plan pretty well for the following year, but I don't know any species that's good at planning for 25 years from now. So yeah. I think we're asking ourselves to do something that doesn't come naturally as you, as you've stated, but do you think that, people have any sense of what is to come or is it like your friend that you wrote about ken who lost everything is it only then when somebody loses something and they can't find another person entity institution to blame that they'll realize the gravity of the situation as you did that day going okay this is happening now i actually do need to talk about it Sadly, I think the answer is yes, that's when it happens. Um, you know, my first book I wrote, you know, I think End of Nature had just come out. And I, I wrote, you know, knowing us, it's going to be, we're going to wait till the end and try to pull an all-nighter, <laughs> you know, the equivalent of an all-nighter, mm-hmm. to save ourselves. I think that, um, you know, I don't mean to be bleak about it, but I do feel like no real traction in terms of 
individuals. I, I do think, you know, as you know, like a big part of the book is speculating on what the world's going to be like in 2062 when my daughter's my age. And the answers, of course, are pretty dark from most of the scientists. But I do think her generation has an awareness of it and that, that we did not. And, you know, I've been pushed during these talks I've been giving to come up with something that is, even though I've said no hope allowed in this book, um, to come up with something hopeful. And one thing I thought about is uniting, since we were press, we focus on our jobs or whatever. Uh, I think with the younger generation, making your job, uh, uniting your avocation and vocation, kind of like making your passion um, your job is one way to face the problem. And I do notice people doing that. Um, you probably read Ministry for the Future, um, the novel, the Cli-Fi novel by now I'm going to Tim Stanley Robinson. Anyway, it's this long novel where all the things we're talking about happen, but there are glimmers of hope near the end. And they come from, uh, interestingly, from different quarters, lawyers suing, lawmakers finally reluctantly making, you know, changing their laws, uh, writers writing, monkey wrenchers, monkey wrenching, and, you know, all across the spectrum. And whether or not that happens, I do think it's a little like writing. You've got to find your own voice in this fight. And and my daughter, for instance, as I mentioned in the book, has the activism gene that I apparently lack. So maybe she'll embrace that. And she's making films right now and, and freshman in college. I can this is what I can do, for better or worse, you know. Um and I do think there are there, there, I mean, if I had to say something hopeful about my experience with the book, it would go back to something you just said about animals and their habitat, is that despite everything I saw, and I've been traveling the last three months also, um, I've been in spectacular natural settings. Uh, for instance, I just had a, you know, the book is partly about drought, and I've been traveling through a West, an American West. It looks like the rainforest. <laughs> Water is gushing everywhere and just, you know, and it's probably an aberration. It's probably just this year. And that's another thing that scientists say about climate, right? We have these swings. But it's been, you know, to go to southern Louisiana, which is diminishing and the land's going away, but still is so bird heavy and beautiful. And to see, you know, my friend Ryan Lambert helping rebuild land there. To go to the, you know, to be in the Rockies, to be on the coast, um, these are still like, you know, it's still a beautiful place. It's still beautiful, and I know it's, you know, it's going away, and things are things are bad. But just just physically being an animal in those places was something that was hopeful to me, and it also connects it to the elemental, in the sense that, you know, you said we broke our contract, and the wind and water and fire is turning against us. But weirdly, that's kind of a paradox of like the awareness of that physical life also brings you an awareness of the threat. Um, that didn't make much sense, but I, I'm, I'm trying to kind of grope my way there. So. Well, it made a lot of sense, you know, to me. And I think one of the things that I heard in what you were saying was also we, we need warriors. We can call them activists. But these warriors yeah. are going to have the greatest impact in a local place. And, and if yes. we propagate, if we propagate that local effort, that is how we might be able to change things. Now, something you said uh, or wrote, I should say, in A Traveler's Guide to the End of the World, Tales of Fire, Wind and Water, really resonated with me. And that was changing the meaning of losing everything. You wrote. What we are losing may be something much larger than our personal possessions or our homes or even our individual lives. What we may be losing is the earth itself, the way it has long been, the way we imagine it still be, and the way we have lived on it. And I think that people in your daughter's generation are experiencing a growing psychological anxiety that might be that repression is is bulging to the surface <laughs> and yeah. i think young people are experiencing an anxiety that 
generations prior to them didn't. But I'm not sure. Do you think this psychological anxiety is is a new concept? Because when I was younger, in my early 20s, I was motivated and terrified about losing tigers and losing pandas and right. losing whales. And I wanted to bludgeon anybody that trophy hunted. <laughs> and, right. Right. and so is it really new or is it at another, is it at next level kind of anxiety, do you think? That's a great question, because I also watch, you know, I interviewed a lot of people, Hadley's age, my daughter's age, and they, too, are masters of repression. I mean, they they want to go to college. They want to, you know, they want to have a party and they want to. And, and of course, this breaks through also. I think, again, I think it's I think the world is what's going to eventually shake our lapels. I think to go back, I mean, I, I mentioned having a wonderful journey through the American West just weeks ago and waterfalls and freshets and creeks filling and everything. Well, then I went north into Canada, which had the opposite winter of the West. It had a dry, uh, abnormally warm winter and smoke was everywhere. And smoke blurred. Um, I was in Banff and you couldn't even see the huge mountains around there. Same with Calgary and the border. So I do think that is what's going to shake us by the lapels, if anything does, is, is the, it being there right in your face. And that's why, as I mentioned, it's a terrible thing for New York City, but it's a good thing for the world in terms of having the media center. Um, so I think the anxiety is real. Um, will the anxiety turn us in a direction where it becomes our top priority. Uh, stay tuned on that one. <laughs> I just, you know, I'm I'm a lover of the literature of nature, and but I'm also kind of a skeptic, if not a cynic. And and I just have watched self interest um, really grow. I'm just I'm reading a well. I, I won't go off on a tangent, but I'm reading about the border wall right now and what it's represented and it's kind of the end of the frontier. And it just seems we keep hurtling in a more and more self-interested, selfish direction. Sure. And, and with with and, and, and in particular, you know, I believe in kind of um environmental justice and but I also believe that when we get just only preoccupied with that we forget about what your things like that you're doing which is beyond anthropocentric justice you know biocentric justice which is to our responsibility to other species and and you know just cutting off the pathways for for other species is is criminal but that's far from the normal thinking right sure i mean we're we're hoping to just nudge people a little a little closer to going like, damn, we better do something about climate. Well, and and it's interesting that you say that I take a more biocentric. It's true, but it's also because ultimately I believe we are part of nature and everything that we do to others. And we have that as the golden rule, right? And how we treat each other. I just, yeah. I make the, the other much larger than just other humans. And, yes. and, and I think that for me, I've always felt that well-being and uh, of, of all beings, the mental and physical well-being is what we're experiencing is being ref like where we are is being reflected back to us. So the chaos and the destruction and the fires and the floods yeah. is really just a reflection of the madness that we have perpetrated on ourselves ultimately. We just might yeah. be the last victim in the in the story. And and we have other sayings, right? Don't don't bite your nose off to spite your face. Right. These these are lessons that actually apply when we're thinking about our relationship to nature. And as someone who's also kind of cynical and kind of pessimistic, the opposite of hope sometimes is grief. And 
I think that there's been an ecological grief overtaking many people who are, who view the world through the lens that, that we might share. Have you experienced any of your own grief about the environment over the years? Well, I'm critical of repressors, but I'm a pretty good one myself. Um, I've had a lot of, not to over, I think we've already gone down a gloomy alley and to get more gloomy, I've had a lot, I've had uh, since COVID and none of it's from COVID. I've had almost a dozen deaths of those close to me, um, you know, friends and family, dogs and cats. And, um, and I am, and I think I, again, I, it's in that chapter called Beneath the Ice, where I finally kind of experienced this grief about my mother at the end, and it all comes pouring out. I am sure that's working its way below the surface with me, but um, I find very little time to stop and feel that grief, which might be psychologically unhealthy. Um, and I just, you know, I, I tend to plunge forward, mostly in the form of traveling and writing and interviewing people. Um, because for whatever reason, because of the, um, because of the, um, these deaths and this fragility, I feel like for me, you know, I'm 62 years old and time is short and, and there's a lot I want to do and a lot I want to create. So again, it's I'm kind of being what I'm criticizing in a way. I'm focused on my life and my my goals. And that of course is another form of blinders, but it also is a form of keeping going in the face of a lot of grief and a lot of uh, loss. So yeah. And um, I I think all living organisms do that. Every individual that I observe is trying to get through the day, make its living do what it needs to do to get to the next day. And yeah. so there's no judgment. I think, I think yeah. it doesn't serve us to be judgmental because even though we are the ones that have created the problem, <laughs> right? the, the fact that we have these blinders on that say, okay, I gotta, you know, I gotta eat today. I gotta, you know, take care of basic needs is, also a part of our biology and connection to every other species that's just trying to figure out a way to survive. Yeah. And maybe, maybe the thing will be once climate comes within those blinders, you know, the hope would be of course that it was seen as this overarching issue and problem that must be solved and put our monkey brains to, to that would be, would be kind of interesting. Um, And I just want to say before we, um, you know, the, the kind of way we're talking about this isn't the standard climate way of talking about it. And one thing the book is about really is about language. And I have found, you know, I say at one point, I think I think our, our climate discussion and our climate literature is somewhat simplistic and immature. Uh, whether it's finger wagging or old prophet testament railing or fact-filled book reports, or as I mentioned before, um, you know, just having bullet points. Um, I, so, I mean, I think one of my goals and how, whether I achieved it or not is up in the air, was just to try to write about it in a way I hadn't seen people write about it before. And I think that naturally is going to start to happen more as the pervasiveness of the problem, you know, permeates our our existence. Because, I mean, and I ask at one point, what are people going to make of our time if writers and artists don't don't openly tackle the largest existential issue we face? So um, I think it's an obligation to some degree. I'm not saying it's all I'm going to write about for the rest of my life, but but I do think like it would be nice for more people to bring more complex, ambiguous, and messy sensibilities to something that's been treated fairly simplistically at this point. I agree. And I think one of the things I appreciated in A Traveler's Guide to the End of the World, many things I appreciated, but from Chaco Canyon to the way, I, I believe it's Diné people. Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, Diné. Yeah. Diné people's tell stories um, is incorporated in the book. And 
I'm curious, to what extent do you think indigenous science, and I call it science deliberately because my definition of science is a way of knowing right. how, you know, and, and so to what extent do you think indigenous science and point of view about being in relationship with the earth and each other can, can assist us? Well, before I say how it can assist us, let me just stress its huge importance, which is pretty apparent to anybody. You know, the genre we're talking about essentially is embracing indigenous philosophy naturally, right? I mean, it's like, I mean, if you're talking about uh, your individual place and your commitment to place, your learning of plants and trees, your telling of stories, you're loving of water and wind and, and fire and elemental things. You're basically um, reiterating, uh, you know, everything you learn when you spend time with indigenous people, right? Uh, so that's kind of a, a no-brainer that 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 that's there. How can how are those stories told? Um, yeah, I think that can be. They, that's a good role model for a society where compelling stories that are grounded in the natural world um, uh, influence how people behave. So definitely, um, you know, there's a danger of um, over romanticizing at times and over simplifying because we aren't in a, you know, I mean, it would be a different world if we were societies of, of smaller groups um, with, you know, with individual leaders and um, you, you could do a lot, lot more to, in terms of local places. But so there's a little danger of over romanticizing, but I, in my experience, it's so in line with where we need to go, which is circling back around to something that, um, that, yeah, that's a, that's a big part of it. And, and a lot of the, on a practical level, a lot of the big environmental initiatives this is just, you know, I was just up in Canada, are from tribes um, saving land. And, you know, it's it's the old school of like uh, some organization coming in, looking at a place, mapping it and trying to save it is segueing into something a little different. And, and you know, Bears Ears is an, is an example of that, you know, but also a lot of things going on in Canada are examples of that. So uh, it's exciting. Uh, I don't know, you know, I don't know how willing Washington, D.C. is, since historically they haven't been very interested in listening to indigenous people uh, as far as leadership. But there have been some good signs, like um, like our Secretary of the Interior, right, Deb Holland. You know. Well, and maybe that's a small place for hope. One of the yeah. th One of the things that... I won't give it all away. Obviously, we want people to read um, your book, but but you describe in there uh, how we can learn from the collapse of other indigenous civilizations, some of which were linked to past slower changes in environmental conditions. And I think, that, and I, I'm, I might be wrong here, but some people might think, well, but they didn't have the technology that we have today. Sure. But for, for that time frame, they had very complex technology that was helping them control water and and grow crops, uh, depending on the particular civilization. Do you yeah. think, you know, why do you think we believe that the very technology that we develop that's injuring the planet is capable of saving it? Is it is it just pure arrogance about our abilities to manipulate the environment or, you, you know, I, I don't know. I, I'm just sort of like wondering how we think more technology or better technology or sure. newer technology <laughs> is really going to do anything well you mentioned chaco and chaco and civilization and i mean the thing about it is we haven't quite reached you know we we haven't been as long around as a civilization as long as they were or as rome was i mean we're you know i don't know why we have this sense that we're lasting forever since nobody has <laughs> so far 
So in that essay or the chapter that you're talking talking about, which was a little bit of a nod to a professor of mine, Red Sonner, who wrote a brilliant essay called Technically Sweet, which with Oppenheimer in the news, interestingly, it was based on the Sistina form, where he took six subjects, and one was Oppenheimer's biography, one was a walk through Los Alamos, one was a hike in the Rockies, and, and he wove them all together. So what I tried to do is take three things. Um, January 6th, um, I was classmates with Jamie Raskin, and so I talk to him about his experience, the congressman's experience. His son, Tommy, had uh, had died the week before, and Tommy was named after Thomas Paine. So I was trying to think about our civilization as possibly a finite thing falling apart. Chaco, and then my experience on the Outer Banks and in North Carolina, where you walk along the beach and see these stilted houses out in the water or on the low tide sand. Um, so. You know, which struck me, you're probably too young, but the old Planet of the Apes ends with um, seeing the Statue of Liberty halfway in the sand on the water. And just it struck me in that sort of way, like incongruous, like and powerful. So Chaco, you know, there have been theories changed all through the years, and it used to be more environmental, their rise and fall was the main theory. But to some degree, it still is because this thriving civilization that is centered in New Mexico um, coincided with incredibly lush, fertile years in the West, similar to the experience I just had this summer. It was wet. And not shockingly, and free rings reveal this, and the civilization boomed. And not shockingly, as it, when it fell, things have become very dry and arid. Now, there are lots of other reasons that it fell apart. But it's important to remember that you know, why were the United States and, you know, this kind of self-delusional, you know, uh, place is because just the vast nat natural resources we had that we that we proceeded to gobble up at this furious rate. And so civilizations are built on physical things and on places and they fall on, on the same thing. So I just wanted to, like, think a little bit beyond the usual way we, we think we think about these things and having civilizations that have that have gone through what we've gone through is a is a pretty good uh thing to look at as a as a possible warning sign, I guess. Sure. And you you acknowledge in the book that you write from a US centric point of view, but yeah. but that doesn't mean that all that you cover in the book isn't represented globally. Yeah, and and one of the reasons I, I it is like that is because I started the book. The book is a year and a half of traveling, and it starts one year after COVID. So I was restricted in my travels. You know, originally I'd imagined when I was conceiving of the book that I would go all around the world. It turned out I didn't have to. I saw plenty in the United States to to um, yeah to scare the hell out of me, basically. Well, you know. I, I recommend A Traveler's Guide to the End of the World, Tales of Fire, Wind, and Water to everyone. And you know, I don't know who said this, and I will try to find it when, I, when this episode comes out, but it was man against nature, nature against man, God against nature, nature against God, God against man, man against God. We've basically set up our most important relationships as war. And we say that about climate too, right? With the yeah. war on climate change and, you know, climate gives and climate takes. And I think right. that when we look at Earth's history, we see that. And in terms of giving, what do you want? people to walk away with from your book? I want them, you know, again, it goes back to awareness. I will say that I use myself as an example of the screwed upness that you just described. Um, uh, the guy I just hiked the Arizona Trail with, um, Jim Campbell, when we were young men, which of course, as you know, from your study of primates, those are the scariest people young men. <laughs> I said at one point, I, I set this thing up where I said, uh, and my wife was, we weren't married yet, but she witnessed this. I was saying like, if Jim and I were the last two people on earth, you know, I, I, he's stronger than me, but I would outsmart him and, you know, I would kill him. And my wife said, 
if you were the last two people on earth, why would you want to kill each other? <laughs> and, which was a fine point, right? I mean, I do think there's this, and is it particularly American? Is it human? There is this versus mentality that I don't think we're going to just entirely break free of. But I do think that just like I'm a little more mature than I was when when I said that stuff, I think we can get a little more mature. <laughs> and I, I hope it's true. It seems like we went in the other direction for a few years there. Um, yeah. And so I guess this is, I hopefully, a more mature form of writing about climate, a sloppier form and something that people can kind of integrate and think about on their own and come to their own conclusions. Um, I don't expect people to all just jump up and pick up their spears and fight for climate when they get done with it, though I wouldn't mind that. Um, but I do hope, again, that that their awareness is increased about the world we're already in and the world we're going to be in when my daughter is my age. Thank you so much, David. It's been wonderful having you on the show. Thank you. Um, and thanks for such a deep and smart reading of the book. We recorded this episode in July at the peak of summer, and this year's COP28 doesn't leave us very optimistic. What has happened is a deepening of self-interest and focus on personal opportunities and a further dimming of the connected community mindset. We have defined success as more, more everything, more stuff, more travel, more fame, more, more, more. And yet, we're more unhappy, more isolated, and much more violent. Over 800 mass shootings in the United States this year alone. We are arguably the most aggressive species on the planet and the only species truly acting against our own self-interest. I know it's grim as we close out the year, but hopefully you have a little bit of hope. What's happening next time? Well, when it comes to success... However you define it, there is a science to it. And one thing many of us have in common is setting goals or resolutions for the new year. I thought it would be a good time to talk about success. So tune in as I kick off the new year with a brilliant, engaging, and successful researcher and author, Albert Laszlo Barabasi, about his best-selling book, The Formula, The Universal Laws of Success. Now, if you're digging the show, subscribe and share it so others can enjoy it too. You can follow the show on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can follow the show on Twitter at WildConnectPod. And you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at RealDrJen. Until next time, happy holidays and wishing everyone a safe and joyous new year. Thanks for listening. 